pink. Well, this is gravely important to me. There was a time during the peak period of Fairly Odd Parents where everything seemed to click. You had TV movies that people still remember to this day, you had ratings that beat Spongebob on some occasions, you had one of the best crossovers of Nickelodeon's history. You have it all. You're Butch Hartman, and you decide to branch off from the first large success to make Danny Phantom around this time, but that's not enough. You want to introduce another show revolving around a young kid becoming a space hero. This is the mediocre story of Crash Nebula. Also plug in my Discord. <laughs> Although there were talks of possibly having a branch of Butch Hartman's work include a Crash Nebula project, all that is ever materialized from it on Nickelodeon's N is an episode in the Fairly Odd Parents series. Although 95% of the episode is Crash Nebula, the shell that keeps this in the realm of Fairly Odd Parents loosely is that Timmy is excited to hear about the origin story of Crash Nebula, but because his fairies cannot stop guessing what the episode would be rather than watching the episode, Timmy spends the entirety of the episode listening to the wrong prediction and that was the way that they wrapped this up. For Fairly Odd Parents, that's not the worst thing, but it's really telling that someone thought that this pilot could stand on its own. Wondering how I got here? The billion light years from Earth? About to be swallowed by a black hole with some weird girl from an antimatter universe? The worst thing is, if I can't figure a way to get us out of this, my sister gets my room. And we get to sort of the big problem. Although it's masked well, if you couldn't tell, there's a big lack of polish due to the grandiose nature that this episode presents itself. But when you fall back on the foundation, there's nothing there. There's nothing that warrants a true connection. In fact, I'd say that the foundation of this episode, the storytelling, is actually pretty bad. Really bad, actually. Even for Hartman shows, it's pretty tough to explain, so let me give you an example. Do me a favor, in the comments below, tell me about a game, either now or from before, that you really like and you resonate with, but the game itself, it's not polished to a non-fan, they'd probably never play it. I'll start first. I love Metropolis Mania. It's a city building game for the PS2. You essentially pay attention to your citizens, giving them what they want as you lay out the city. And as simple as that sounds, it's not really polished. In fact, it's kind of broken in certain areas. And if you like city building games, I would never recommend this first or second or even seventh. I also like the wrestling games from Matt Dickey. They're incredibly not polished and it's very easy to see that. The graphics aren't exactly great and the gameplay can be pretty limited to someone who's adjusted to other wrestling games, but I love it. And my point here is that I think many of us have media, gaming, shows, music that we love, but it's not technically sound even for its time. A polished game doesn't exactly equal good, in the same way that a polished show doesn't exactly equal to good. So even though a lot of these shots functionally work, they're pretty sloppy. And maybe it's a product of its time. But you know what's always timeless? Good storytelling. <laughs> Your brother isn't going away forever. He's just going off to a fancy new school for a while. So, this is simple. Sprig Spivak, the main character here, is getting ready for a fancy new school. He's grown up on a farm, but he clearly has a lot of energy and interest in comic books. He also has an annoying little sister that the family puts up with because, yeah. The mother is basically the most basic cartoon mom. Loves her children, cries, has a singular defining activity, in this case, knitting. And the father is a typical media farm dad. Proud of his boy, doesn't see any harm in giving hand-me-downs, gives his son an extremely primitive gift, in this case, cow dung. Yep, this naturally occurring source of fuel has been in our family for five generations. It's yours now, boy. Wow, thanks. Now, I'm not being sarcastic. This is actually a touching family moment that just happens to involve poop. They say it lasted through generations, but that literally has no meaning here. And I don't need every show to be like Steven Universe and Gravity Falls where there's a lot of depth and you can look into it very deeply if you want to, but there should at least be something. Like if we're gonna criticize a little crap here, what is the sheer difference between cow dung and cow dung that has lasted generations? You know, beyond the fact that it looks like he just scooped it up from Otis like 10 minutes ago. Generally these heirlooms have histories attached to them, so you know the battles fought and how the item is used 
useful. Literally, you can replace this with a AA battery and it'd have the exact same effect, both in the story and in general when it comes to the lack of depth in this special. Oh, and he also looks at the camera and narrates to himself a lot, Sprig. And under normal circumstances, that just seemed fine. I'm pretty sure Deadpool does it a lot, but with the lack of depth in this story and him explaining the obvious or telling a joke that doesn't land, it just seems pretentious. Now, put yourself in Sprig's shoes here. You're going to a school in space after saving an alien princess, naturally. You would think the school that you're going to has, well, aliens in it, correct? I could be somebody different. Somebody cool, somebody totally unafraid of the unknown. <laughs> now, if you saved a human princess and you were on this bus full of aliens and you were scared, that's one thing, but did it never cross his mind that in space he'd probably not see his kind? Are you telling me that in those comic books not one of them had a space squid or a crazy alien creature? But forget all that. We know why jokes like that are in here. They're here because Sprig Spivak went to the Butch Hartman online school of and then the opposite happens. You see, now it's online not because of what's happening today, but because they said Sprig never left for school, so obviously he took this class online. So here is the part where the show wants to make Sprig seem relatable, even on an alien ship he is still made fun of, but let's look at the reasoning here. Toss out the stereotype that aliens always deem humans an inferior race even though these shows are written by humans who have to come up with what the aliens say for being so inferior. Let's actually take a minute to think about the implications of this scene for a second. What is an alien? Sorry to get a little bit philosophical for a Butch Hartman cartoon, but I would say it's a creature from outer space, right? So let's say they appear in their natural form and we see them. They don't look like us. So remove any cloning equipment that they have so that in this scenario, they do not look like us. It's not like a weird situation where they look like us because that's the way that they'd like to present themselves in their own natural form. You would say that that creature looks weird, but here's the big part. Those aliens look weird to us, to us, to us humans. However, wouldn't the hyperspace part and traveling through space imply that all of these aliens would also come from their own home planets and galaxies and solar systems and therefore be different species and all of these different planets would have their own different dominant species to them yes they'd see us humans as weird but wouldn't they see all of the other aliens around them as weird as well like with other animals we deem that we are separate from animals but i'm pretty sure other animals do not perceive themselves to all be lumped in the same category just because humans said so but to crash nebula none of what i said is true all of the aliens had a secret meeting to get on the human for what all of you are aliens all of you are different species you would all be weird to us all of them is weird but that logic follows for all of them individually there is a depth loss because we have to make sprig look like your average kid who no one understands but is much more unique than the other guys we then have ironically richard stephen horvitz the voice of zim a much better alien that has this crazy thing called depth explain to us that sprig is sitting on mark chain's gooey cousin <laughs> That's not a chair, you earth idiot. That's my friend. So the episode goes to explain that Sprig is a loser because he's human. That's it. He's an evolved primate, but other than that, no one should care about him. While I acknowledge that that's a very common trope when it comes to schoolmates, I don't believe these are characters. There is no reason for them to do any of this. And it seems like the writing philosophy isn't what would this character do, it seems more what would the trope of this character do. Yes, Spongebob is super happy and optimistic, but in Can You Spare a Dime, an episode I like a lot and I reviewed, he yells, he chokes out Mr. Krabs, he's angry. Now, does someone who is super happy and optimistic do that? Trope wise, no. Does Spongebob do that given the prior reasoning in the episode? Yes. And that's the difference between the good writing and season 9 and 10 of Fairly Odd Parents. And yes, I know Crash Nebula, this episode is from season 5, but it has the writing of season 8 and 9. When approached about why such a loser would be going to a prestigious school, he tells the story of how he saved Princess Galaxandra, who is either the dean, the principal, some kind of authority of the academy. Now by save, he means run away and have the problem solved by only half of his skill and execution. Now here's a good example of shifting the style of the narrative told. Doing my chores like always. Sprig, time for supper! Mom, my turkey! What was that last part? 
done, let me finish. The space bird jumps in unexpectedly and with short notice, and it works because you're expecting the narrative to play out. With him jumping over the story and it hard cutting back to the bus, it works. So yes, in theory, Sprig looking at the camera should work too, but there's a reason beyond this is his quirk, he's so meta. Also, if you didn't notice when the flashback starts, there's a Danny Phantom sort of comic on the back. And don't worry, we'll be getting to that show a little bit soon. But more importantly, just so that I can condense all of my thoughts on one character down to one section, let me just start off by saying I respect Tara Strong as a voice actor. She has an incredible talent. And in retrospect, this is not her fault. Whoever told her that this voice was okay and not ear bleedingly bad, they're a part of the problem. Yes, an annoying voice for an annoying child seems natural, but with the stereotypical annoying brat sister, I don't need the voice to be annoying to me. Trust me, by sentence one, I already know that she's the bratty sister. You don't need to amp it up. Her entire character exists to be a brat, specifically the Sprig, and that's it. How does she feel about Sprig going away beyond the can I have his room joke? What does she think of space in comic books? What does she do on the farm? All of these questions and more ignored on Crash Nebula. This fight also happens for about two to three minutes and most of it is just running. You know, for an action show, uh, there isn't a lot of action. So that makes you the first Earth kid ever to be enrolled in the Celestia? the Academy? That's right! Hey everybody, it's this year's charity case! <laughs> Rockwell. On it. I believe Ving just told a joke. <laughs> See this? This is what I like to call potential. What is the relationship between Ving and Rockwell? Does Ving see Rockwell as under him? Can we speak to the other students away from Ving? Can we get some behind the scene cases here? Were those other two losers actual charity cases? All of these questions and more ignored on Crash Nebula. It wouldn't bother me, but when every character has a stereotypical and rigid and limited role within your first published piece to a project that you really want to get off the ground, I don't know what you expect me to think. Now granted, if I were to give at least some benefit of the doubt and play devil's advocate here, I would not be surprised if this episode had to shift its writing to be of the same type of Fairly Odd Parents. And that wouldn't be great. While Hartman's style is distinct, I would not want a Fairly Odd Parents episode to be written like a Danny Phantom episode. And I wouldn't want a Danny Phantom episode to be written like a Tough Puppy episode. Each show has a specific tone, language, and expectations. You couldn't just mesh them together and call it a day. If that's what happens here, that's fine. I totally understand. Like I said, the unpolished nature of all of this, it doesn't phase me. I like a lot of unpolished pieces of media. But what annoys me is that there's no meat here. We're being sold the sizzle, this cool idea of a space boy who turns out to become this legendary superhero Crash Nebula, but I don't really care enough to see his journey. You see, he's just saying the obvious here on Storytelling 101. If you want a good story, you need a character that people are interested in, and a journey that people are interested in, for that character at the bare minimum. And this character here is paper thin, really generic, and is written in a way that clashes with a lot of Harmon's work from other shows that have done the concept better. The journey? Unsure of where it wants to go beyond the stereotypes and presents itself no different from the others in its section. Star Wars and Star Trek? Yes, sci-fi, but you couldn't call them the same shows because there's nuance there. Even with something that's so stifled societally as children's animation, you can't take Teen Titans Go and call it the same as Ben 10, the reboot. There's still nuance there, even more than the obvious. By the way, I know these space shots are supposed to feel cinematic and whatnot, but I honestly couldn't care less. You could get the exact same experience if you fly through Minecraft at 10 frames per second. Oh, you again! Time for your welcoming wound. Oh boy, you See this? This is what I like to call potential, but lost potential. Let's take the paper thin plot and examine it. It shouldn't take that long. Do you remember the two things that Sprig was given by Pa and Ma? Dung, yes, but also a sweater made out of presumably the yarn that he's throwing away to distract the space cat. Wouldn't it have been an easy throwback to take out the sweater, do some cartoony arrangement into a ball of yarn and throw that? At least it would have given the gift some weight, and you wouldn't be able to say that it was just there for advancing the story because as we'd see later on, his bus mates protect them, so it would make the yarn seem more than just what it is. You see how that time Tiny readjustment makes the story have a tad bit more depth, and people would take it a tad bit more seriously. He'd answer a rhetorical question from a space teacher, and his consequence is to run laps with the entire class. I guess if you were trying to do the whole human doesn't understand alien culture bit, this is implying that they were going to do something else in Galactic Defense. But once again, why is it humans and aliens? Shouldn't it be a whole bunch of different species in space and not just two? How come all of the other aliens collectively understand significantly more? Hey! 
Get away from my soon-to-be girlfriend, Squeege. Oh, quack off thing. I don't date matter. What? You plan on taking on the charity case too? Hey! Straight out of DeviantArt. This is not good dialogue. I'm sorry. I know the demographic is for those younger than me, but he is a villain for villain's sake and isn't even a quarter of entertaining. Like if this were any of the other vast superhero cartoons where there is a monster of the week, at least the hero itself provides an interesting dynamic between the monsters or the other characters. At least the monsters have some weight to them. At least they're cool. And Cheap Shot, I know, but here's another show that shows how Butch Hartman, the family-oriented guy, handles women and relationships. I'll just say you're my girlfriend, and after enough persuasion, you'll buckle under, or even better yet, you'll find what I'm saying to be romantic. You know what a good villain can benefit from though? Henchman, a sidekick, a lackey, all great answers from the audience, but where Rockwell and Ving are supposed to be the muscle and the talker respectively, what do you think Ving's superpower shouldn't be, the, the person that's on the screen right now? Like if Rockwell is the big bad rock alien tough dude who can intimidate anyone around him and we've seen that in the bus scene and have his main attribute be super strength, then what is the one singular attribute that Ving shouldn't have or else it would completely ruin the point of Rockwell's character, the dynamic, his entire existence within the show? So that's what he can do. And don't tell me that he couldn't be in this form because it's too big. Once he was beginning the transformation, everyone ran, which means that he has a perfect way to intimidate people. Now a smart or creative person may think that he has Rockwell for smaller areas in which he couldn't bulk up, or to befriend the closest person to taking his status as the number one person in the class, so that he never has to worry, but that's all speculation, and considering the credibility of Butch's future work, and the way the episode has been going so far, I doubt that'd be the case. So we get to pretty much the final part, and yes, with about 9 minutes to go. Sprig hits the panic button and he goes flying because Ving can't be a hero, but Sprig can. I love when the villain is bad and confident when the story needs him to be, but not in other areas. I'm gonna describe this space scene in a very, very clear way. I would much rather watch the worst fight in Danny Phantom than this, I'm almost sure of that. The intentions of this space scene is to prove that Sprig has heart. It doesn't prove that. It proves that Sprig can run, and that he's great at running, which the scene of him saving the princess already reinforced. Sprig doesn't have heart, he just has ignorance over what's happening here. The only teacher we've seen so far doesn't like him, the entire school doesn't like him, he's most likely going to die, and all of it is because of the fact that he's a human. Now you can say it was because Ving smelled fear in Sprig, but I like to believe that if we're assuming that all of these people were new, which doesn't make a clear distinction on, Ving would have found someone to bully well before Sprig. Also, isn't the stereotype that the bully starts to bully the main character because they're new they're supposed to be grabbing all of the attention away at, like from the main girl or from the school and the bully becomes envious if anything ving wouldn't need to do anything to sprig because everyone was already hostile and everyone was already laughing at him and everyone was already ready to laugh at him and why like why if he's inferior in every way and shape and form then wouldn't our primitive brains be enough of a setback that you wouldn't need to worry about us twice now you have been been confronted with the strange, wondrous, and dangerous things that exist in the universe, and faced them without fear. Oh my gosh, she's totally buying it. And that's the main problem of Crash Nebula. It's a bunch of stereotypes that granted, after a decade, it looks even worse, but there's nothing beyond it beyond a space boy. Just look at the title card of Crash Nebula. That's all you get from this episode. That's all that this episode is good for. A picture of a space boy. And we can all speculate about how well it can go, but this episode will never deliver on it. There's no sci-fi and drama like in Danny Phantom. There's cliches and tropes. There's no genuine interest in space beyond names that are puns and clear CGI moments. There's no passion in it. It's just the uncanny middle of the mediocre parts of Danny Phantom and the predictable and cringeworthy parts of Fairly Odd Parents. Of course he saves her. Of course everyone so hates him, but the princess, because he saved her, 
Somewhere in there, he learns to become the Crash Nebula that we know today. But it never came to be. Something about a rumor that it looks too similar to a Sky High movie, I don't really care. It might be it, but this wouldn't have stuck the way that Danny Phantom stuck. It's way too similar. I know we have stuff like the Loud House and the Casa Grandes, which a lot of people see as similar, including myself, but the difference between those two and Danny Phantom and Crash Nebula is that those two shows embrace the concept of being together. So the writing style doesn't need to change all that much if the original show is successful and they want to bring fans of the first show over to the second show. Here I'd imagine that that little plug is just a plug, there's not much to it, and they're two separate worlds between Danny Phantom and Crash Nebula. And again, Crash Nebula is just going to rehash Danny Phantom with the comedy of the lowest points of Fairly Odd Parents. Crash Nebula sucks, Timmy didn't get to see it, the end. Make sure to follow my Discord, until then such a thanks to the supporters of July, and until next time, take care. Alpha out.